Okay, shall we begin? I think it's time to begin. All right, except, you know what? My clicker isn't working. Oh boy, I was I was so, so sure I was just gonna smoothly take care of that. Why isn't my clicker working? There we go, clicker's working. All right, now we're actually getting started. Hello everyone, <laughs> welcome to Deathloop's user research user experience, Deathloop, Dana's version. <laughs> this uh, talk is about user research and user experience. Uh, I should take a moment and actually explain what uh, these things are in case they're unfamiliar. User research is feedback on the player experience, on the player experience from outside of the development team. It originates, uh, it is uh, organized into reports around milestones and key deliverables, and it is a mix of expert analysis, playtesting, focus groups, and mock reviews. And we are going to refer to that usually as UR. User experience design is an iter iterative approach to build parity between all aspects of the game and how these aspects are understood in the player's minds. But that's kind of a, it's kind of a like esoteric academic definition of it. Um, I think it's more useful for just everyday uh, thinking about the term to consider it. Yes, that's that's abbreviated to UX. <laughs> it's uh, helpful to think of it as a design methodology that really puts the player's experience first. So as a, I, as a designer, have a certain idea, a certain vision, my goal is to get it into the game, but what's important is how the player experiences it. That's more important than like my design intentions. It's what their experience with it is. And user experience design, UX, is that uh, mentality. So let's do a breakdown of the talk. First, we're going to discuss who I am. I think most of you already know that, but we'll do it anyway. Look at a bit about my experience, and then we shall uh, talk about what Deathloop is. And again, I think most of you attending today already know what Deathloop is, and I don't really need the spoiler warning, but it's there just in case. Uh, we will then do some time travel back to uh, third quarter of 2020, and then we'll do that UR UX Deathloop. During that, we're going to review a user research report. Uh, we're going to break down the challenges that we face, and we're going to look at how we reacted to them. Uh, we will do a Q&A session at each of the uh, milestones throughout the talk, and then we're gonna repeat the process. So we're in a loop in the talk. Uh, during all that, we're gonna get some key takeaways, such as user experience design is not a straight line. Uh, a smart fix to big issue can reveal problems elsewhere. And sometimes the obvious solution to UX issue is actually the wrong one. That will lead us to third quarter of 2021. So we'll cover about a year of development in uh, 40, 50, 60 minutes. We'll see how, how, much it how much time it takes us to get through it. And then we'll do takeaways and wrap up. So a little about myself. Uh, as I think most of you know, my name is Dana Nightingale. I am a campaign director at Arcane Leon. I'm as old as Pac-Man. Uh, I was a big nerd who liked uh, the games of Looking Glass Studios, and I made websites about them. I got a master's degree in architecture and then never used it to make architecture. I joined Arcane as a level designer in 2010, moved to France a few years later, and I remain there, of course, to this day. And oh yeah, my pronouns are she, her. I'm transgender. I came out in February of 2021, which was still like pretty fresh news when I made this talk. So it seems it seems like ancient history now, but back then it was like one of the one of the coolest things I loved announcing. <laughs> so what about my game dev experience? Uh, I did my time as a modder. I did do mods for Thief 2 and a bit for Skyrim a little bit later. Uh, most of my career was as a level designer. I did level design work for basically every Dishonored uh, title and a little bit for Wolfenstein as well. But we're here to talk about my campaign design work on Deathloop. But what is a Deathloop? Deathloop is a game in which you play Colt, who is an armed amnesiac who discovers that he's trapped 
in a day-long time loop on the island of Black Reef. Colt is being hunted by his best frenemy, Juliana, who seems to know what's going on, unlike Colt, but really just wants to kill him over and over and over again. Deathloop is a narrative and uh, puzzle-focused first-person shooter. It features four small open-world-ish maps filled with quests and side content. It is very non-linear. You may go where you want, uh, when you want, and it is from the Immersive Sim School of Design. So it means you could play your way at your pace in your style. <clears throat> Excuse me. Colt's goal <clears throat> of the game as the protagonist is to break the time loop. And to do this, he must eliminate the eight visionaries before midnight. If he fails, the day is going to loop again and again, over and over, forever. So let's do our time travel. We're going to go all the way back to the Halcyon days of August 2020. And this is where our story begins. And that story begins when Deathloop was uh, freshly in alpha. So to understand Deathloop's alpha, I have to explain a couple of things. One is the layout of the world in space and time, what Elite is and how it works. And uh, we're going to start with the space-time one. <laughs> so let's look at the uh, districts. We have uh, Updam, which is one of those small open world-ish maps that I mentioned. Uh, but in Deathloop, you can visit this location at four times of the day. For example, morning, noon, afternoon, and evening. There's also the complex, which again, you can visit during these four time periods. Uh, Freestad Rock, which has three time periods and Carl's Bay, likewise with three. This is our space-time diagram. This was used throughout production, constantly on our whiteboards everywhere and in all of our documentation, and I'm going to be referencing it uh, now and then throughout this presentation. So when you're visiting the same location at a different time of day, you will discover unique clues and vignettes and encounters. To break the loop, you must kill eight visionaries in one loop. Let's count them off. We have Harriet, who makes her base in Carl's Bay in the morning. And there's Frank, who lives in Freestad Rock. Juliana, who has an outpost in Updam. Fia, who is based in Freestad Rock as well. Charlie, who also lives in Updam. Uh, Wenji, who is in the complex. Igor, also the complex. And finally, Alexis Dorsey, who has a mansion in Updam that you can visit in the evening. You, of course, uh, play Colt, and you're out to kill some people. Uh, we are going to do an example player. This player decides to go to Freestead Rock in the morning to defeat Frank. They're successful. Frank is dead. We have one kill, and then time passes. Next, this player will go after Charlie. Another success. Charlie is dead, and then time passes. And now we go after Wenji, really our only option here in the afternoon. When she's dead, time passes, and now our final decision is to go after Alexis. And we see that we have a really small math problem. I don't know, it's, it's, it might be really complicated, but it seems pretty straightforward that 4 is not equal to 8. I think we have to uh, figure something out to make this work. Because <laughs> at this point, the day will loop, and now we're back to square one. Everyone's alive again. Congratulations, you have killed nobody. So how do you kill all eight in a single loop? Well, that's what a lead is for. What the heck is a lead anyway? These are the game's murder puzzle. They are quest lines designed by the campaign designer. So the original uh, campaign designer, campaign director was Christophe Carrier. I picked up uh, the work where he left off. And during these, you will make discoveries. You will investigate uh, these discoveries, you will solve problems, and finally, you'll build a plan and execute it. Solving these builds towards the golden loop. This is where, the loop where you kill all eight visionaries through your magical uh, crafty scheme, and it will be expressed through a dedicated journal UI, which also includes uh, HUD elements like uh, on-screen notifications and markers. Pretty simple stuff. But how do they work exactly? Exactly. Let's do an example lead. Uh, in Freestad Rock, we can go after Frank, but rather than kill him, we can do some investigation. And while we're investigating, we learn that Frank has been emailing this guy named Otto, and Otto makes fireworks. 
Hmm, fireworks are dangerous. I bet we can make them explode if Frank. Frank is planning to soon, at noon, send Otto information about the uh, location the fireworks will be stored. Um, but he hasn't yet. Unfortunately, Frank's club is not accessible at noon, so in order to uh, intercept this email, we have to go to Otto's shop. So we leave Frank alive so that he has the ability to send the message, and we go to Updom at noon. We, go, we find Otto's fireworks shop, but oh no, it's been burned to the ground. Yeah, I guess fireworks really are dangerous. But we know it was fine in the morning due to the correspondence, so... Let's use the time loop. We'll go back in time in the morning and we'll stop the fire. So day loops, we go to auto shop. We find that it's fine, like we, like we thought. Uh, there's a puzzle to stop the fire. Not really a puzzle, there's gameplay, there's stuff to do. Um, and then with the fire successfully presented, we can proceed to the next time period, return to auto shop, find it's untouched, read that message, we discover the fireworks are being stored in Carl's Bay, we get a key code to open that container, and now we have a plan. We're going to go to Carl's Bay and we're going to do some light sabotage. So let's do exactly that, get those fireworks nice and sabotaged, so when Frank launches them in the evening, he will definitely explode and die a fiery death. But how does that actually help us? That seems like a lot of work. The key thing to remember is that that fireworks launcher is already there in the morning. So what we can actually do is looking at the big picture. When we go to Carl's Bay in the morning, we can do two things instead of one. We're going to eliminate Harriet, and we're also going to sabotage the, those fireworks. So in the evening, Frank is destined to die. This means that we now have the ability to kill two visionaries in the morning for a grand total of five still not quite eight it's a start we'll get there it's a step in what will become the golden loop what's next let's look at the progression system and talk about how it works actually this hinges on something called the infusion ability and a resource called residuum you can gather loot, uh, gear during a loop this can be weapons abilities perks more weapons, more abilities, more perks. You also are gathering residuum, that's that resource. Um, the gear is lost when the days loop, so the whole point of this is to figure out a way to keep it, magically keep it across time loops. You use this infusion ability and spend the residuum to keep it. Now it's part of your personal arsenal. Uh, the residuum is also lost when the day loops, uh, but we can sacrifice our gear as well to gain more. So we can infuse more things per loop and as you play, you can eventually uh, infuse everything, and you can build out quite a substantial permanent arsenal and become quite powerful. Next, we're going to break down the game's structure. So this is a single play session, maybe 10 minutes, maybe 60 minutes, anywhere in between. You'll begin by choosing your time and location. It could be a target mission. It could be following a lead. It could be exploring and learning about the world, or it could be all three. I like it when it's all three. Uh, afterwards, you have the opportunity to infuse the gear that you collected. Time will pass. You do it all over again. The entire game is structured uh, as so. You begin with a prologue. Uh, then you have these uh, eight target missions. You can go and do them. And as you're doing them, you're exploring the world, you're learning about it, and you're finding these clues called break the loop clues that are gathering in a journal. When you follow up on those clues with investigation, you can unlock one of the five leads. When all five are completed, the golden loop is available. And then congratulations, player, you've won the game. Roll credits. So what's the state of the game during alpha? What does an alpha for a game like this look like? Uh, the game could be played from start to finish with guidance, so typically like a big walkthrough doc that like the tester had uh, at their elbow while playing. Uh, all of the maps and the weapons and the gadgets and the powers and the NPCs, those are present, those are in the maps, those are working. Uh, UI is not finished, we're still missing some, some key narrative scenes, those are all still being worked out. 
uh, AI behavior was not quite finished yet. NPCs were there, you could play with them, but they were still missing a lot of their abilities. And there wasn't really any game economy balancing done yet. So how much residuum you could get, what gear you would get when, how much that gear cost, none of that had been worked out yet. But you know, game's not done. Uh, alpha, of course, means testing. So I think it's time to, if, if my slide will progress, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> we knew it was rough, rough around the edges, but we were pretty confident that we were making something special. So now it's finally time to send it off to the user research team. And this is when we are going to do our first break for questions. Uh, were Evening, Chris Tedrock, and New and Carl's Bay maps ever considered? If so, why were they next? Uh, they did exist. Um, they were cut pretty early. Uh, that all has to do with uh, not just scope, but like uh, quality of content. Like we, we knew that we wanted each map to be unique, to be memorable, to have uh, the type of content that made the player feel like when they go there, they're going to find something special and cool. And we looked at just the number of maps we wanted to create, the number of variations we wanted to make, and we just had to make some calculated decisions. Like if we cut two of these, that's going to help us meet uh, meet our schedule uh, better. It helps us uh, consolidate our ideas, our ideas in the places where they have the most impact. And overall, those were the two time periods where it looked like um, everything in them could safely exist in another uh, map or in another time period. And that's why those two were chosen uh, to be cut might get answered in the following slides, but how do you get everyone in the studio on the same page with this complex game design? That was actually the topic of my talk uh, from Wednesday called A Great Level Design is a Studio-Wide Effort. Um, I'm, if you missed that, I'm going to put that uh, on YouTube. I'll probably get that done this weekend. Um, but yeah, that's that is a huge question. That's a huge topic. I have a whole 60 minute talk about that. I have a whole second talk about that that I'm working on right now called Lining Around Level Design. It's a massive undertaking. It's incredibly complicated. Um, so I can't answer that right now. Were Evening Chris Tedrack, uh, Noon, or Carl's Bay considered for a DLC or another patch somewhere down the line? Um, that, that would often get like brought up, brainstorm considered, but there was never like a serious plan to, uh, to do that. Um, we felt like uh, an add-on of that magnitude, like the, the amount of, of work and content that we need to be created in order to restore those two time periods in like a DLC or add-on um, would probably be better spent doing something just entirely new instead um so that's why like the the idea to bring those back never really got past like like early pitching phases so so no it wasn't really something that uh, we strongly considered let's keep going okay let's see what the user researchers said about our alpha milestone so they played the game and here's what's cool about the game uh, the players immediately liked the characters of Colt and Juliana during the game's prologue. Wonderful thing to hear. It's so satisfying to like know that you nailed that early, that the player actually likes the protagonist, that they actually like the antagonist. So that was just a big moment of relief of like, okay, we nailed that. What's next? So the problem there was their rivalry wasn't making sense to anyone. They didn't understand why Colt wanted to break the loop, if Juliana wanted to help him or stop him, and what killing visionaries even had to do with breaking the loop in the first place. Players were intrigued by the game's mysteries and cited them as a source of their investment. But we failed to pay off that investment uh, in the hours after the prologue. Players really wanted to understand what is this island of Black Reef and what's going on here. Who is Colt really? Why did he lose his memory? Break the loop? What does that mean? How do I do that? 
players found it to be an interesting but confusing uh, roguelike. But that's not very cool because Deathloop is not a roguelike. It's not even a roguelite. Players didn't understand when and why you'd lose your gear and that residuum in infusion could be used to keep your gear. Players found the minute-to-minute -minute gameplay enjoyable, but they were all playing it like a straightforward first-person shooter. Players did not understand that you would get nowhere if you just killed the visionaries over and over without looking for any clues and that the time of day mattered. They would go to the visionaries' uh, locations, bases, and just find it locked and just not know what to do. But what was really not cool was some players didn't understand that you needed to kill all eight visionaries in a single loop in order to break the loop. They would just play through a couple of loops, kill all eight, and then wonder why the game wasn't completing. Some players did not understand that they were in a time loop at all. They just completely missed it. They're like, what's going on? I don't get it. Some players managed to find that fireworks lead that I walked you through and complete it. And what's even cooler is those players did seem to get the game. They reported enthusiasm about seeing it through to the end. To those players, the game worked. So we had what we call uh, an onboarding problem. We weren't, we put everything into the, in the prologue into driving homes, the game's mysteries, and it worked. It worked fantastically. Players felt just as lost and confused as Colt did. We weren't so much onboarding as unboarding. What we needed was an onboarding strike team. What goes into such a thing? First of all, what is a strike team? Uh, these are where we have a group of developers across discipline uh, and the key disciplines needed to complete the task are represented. It's a light headcount. If the entire studio is in the strike team, it's not a strike team. All members are senior and autonomous. They can be trusted to just go solve the problem and not have to like ask permission to make decisions, basically. So who are who who are our members? Who's who's in the crew? What's the gang look like? We have our a lead UI UX designer who will continue work on the unfinished UI and will advise all of the other designers in the strike team on the user experience design of onboarding. We have a systems designer who will be designing all of the non-diegetic tutorials and all of the features related to them. Those are those tutorials where like something is popping up on your HUD with either instructions, video, that kind of thing. Systems designer is creating those. We have a gameplay programmer who will be uh, supporting the systems designer's design with code. We have a narrative designer who is handling um, all of the writing that are in, that is involved with not just the non-diegetic tutorials, but also all of the new um, onboarding content that the player will be experiencing as they play. That all needs to be authored. We have a level designer, certainly, who is uh, the map owner of the prologue map and will modify existing maps uh, across the game as needed for all the decisions that the strike team is making related to onboarding. We have a gameplay programmer who's providing support to the narrative designer and level designer to make sure that the things they're trying to do are actually possible. We have our producer who is coordinating this team within itself and also this team's collaboration with other teams across the studio. And we have a, a campaign designer who is uh, kind of the, the, the leader of the strike team and will have design ownership of all of the critical path related onboarding content. That was me. But what actually is a campaign designer? Campaign designer is a member of the level design team, uh, the owner of the game's critical path and principal designer of the leads. Like I mentioned previously, uh, this uh, death loop had two. There was the previous campaign director, and then I took over um, after a couple of years. Uh, campaign designer provides the team with a global view of the player's experience and must also be a user experience designer. And that's where we run into a problem because I had never been trained in user experience design. I could barely even say what it was. I'm like, okay, I've got to be an expert in this thing now. So um, yeah, uh, I had only been campaign designer 
for several months at this point. My main focus had been the design of the murder puzzle itself, so not onboarding. I was focused on getting the player to the end of the game, not getting the player to build in like an understanding of the game and how to play it. Like what's what like what are the rules? What am I supposed to do? I had no experience in that. There had been already many user research reports uh, throughout uh, the production thus far, but they had been pretty focused on the core gameplay loop, not really campaign content, so I hadn't really fully engaged with them yet. Like this was the first UI report that I had actually read. Uh, UX was always associated with UI work, so even though I was aware of it, I understood very little of it because I thought, oh, UX, that's something for UI designers to know about. What do I need to know about UX design as a level designer or a campaign designer? I was a sweet summer child. It was time to learn fast. Because we have an unboarding to solve. So I've been talking about onboarding for a while. Maybe it's time to actually explain a little bit about what I mean by that and what we mean by onboarding. Uh, this is the player's overwhelming sense of confusion as a direct result of the prologue, often lasting for several hours. What do we do to onboard them? Here are our goals. We want to put a spotlight on the time loop and how it works, make, the player, make sure the player understands that the time loop exists. What are the rules of the time loop? We want to clarify Colt and Juliana's central conflict of breaking the loop, where Colt wants to break it, Juliana wants to protect it. We want to reduce the mystery overload, over, over, we want to reduce the mystery overload during the prologue, except do we? Do we really want to do that? Because players liked the mystery. The problem was that we went too long without including any type of payoff. We didn't ever answer any of their questions. So no, let's not do that. We're going to throw that in the bin. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to provide some of that payoff. Not a lot, not everything. Some questions we'll never answer, but we're going to give them a few of the answers to the questions they seek in those first hours. And we want to demystify the progression system. We want to thoroughly explain residuum infusion, how it works, how, how, how you can do this thing that players were not doing. Like I think no player had used it during that first test. So we got together, we had meetings, brainstorms, we talked, we argued many, many, many hours in heated discussion, and we decided that what we needed was an extended opening chapter. The chapter was going to be in exception to the rest of the game, entirely linear. It was going to uh, rely on the leads UI elements that already existed, so we're not reinventing the wheel for everything. Uh, but we were not going to allow the player to choose their location or their time of day during uh, this section, during this opening chapter. We were going to structure it like other narrative action games, like Dishonored, uh, while easing the player into the world. So we don't try to explain everything them, to them at once. We start them off with a very familiar format, let them figure things out before we drop them off the deep end. But this is game dev, so we have constraints. There's always constraints. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Uh, first one, uh, we're not gonna make any new maps for this. This is going to take place in the existing maps and the edits to the existing maps must be light. This was not going to be in like instantiated, I think that's how you pronounce that word, little pieces of the map that were unique. No, the maps you visit during this opening chapter were going to be literally the same maps that you play during uh, the time loop for the rest of the game. We want to reuse as much existing narrative and art as possible. We have to make like decisions that are based on budget, scope. We can't just go wild inventing a million new things. We have to be economical. Uh, it has to coexist with content from the entire game. It's like I said, this new adventure is taking place in those maps. So as the player's playing, they have to, like the, the new content has to be able to mesh and, and, and feel like it fits in with all of the existing content. And that of course means that those visionary encounters in the mid to late game content should be avoided however possible during this opening chapter. We don't want the player trying to like, you know, go, go, go after, uh, 
go into FIA's base and ha detonate a, a nuclear reactor or whatever while they're trying to do the opening chapter. That's not cool. So what follows is not an explanation of the new opening chapter. It's a walkthrough of designing it. So welcome to my design process. I like to nail down how a thing begins and how it ends first. So we are going to begin with the prologue. The prologue was, for the most part, working very well. So we're not going to change what's, what's good. We have to find existing content to retool in order to, to, to meet our goals. We're not going to create everything from scratch. So we zeroed in on uh, Juliana's target mission, which was never really working to begin with, and uh, her lead, which was called The Hunt at that time, but really focused on just the opening stages of it, which involved uh, an NPC. So we're going to put that onto our, our little artist palette here. But we want one more thing. We're going to take the moment that Colt learns how to break the loop, pull it out of the prologue and move it into this collection of stuff that we're going to mine for, for content for the opening chapter's conclusion. Okay, so what's in here? In the alpha, Colt learns how to break the loop at the end of the prologue. Later, at some point in the game, maybe in 30 minutes, maybe in, in 30 hours, you can pursue Juliana to an outpost in Updom. There uh, you find, instead of her, she's not there, you find an NPC who will provide a cult with some clues to send them on the right track to finding Juliana. Uh, but while there, you can stumble across this document that just happens to be nearby, um, which provides a little bit of background lore about the world, such as why killing all eight visionaries breaks the loop, and that they're going to spread out to make this impossible. It's just a thing the player could find. So we're going to throw all these into my witch's cauldron and uh, and let them brew a bit. Oops, skip the animation. Oh well, trust me, the animation looked cool. And out comes distilled something called the Loop Preservation Protocol, or LPP, and an encounter with a friendly NPC. So in the new version, Colt is now specifically searching for this thing called the LPP Loop Preservation Protocol, which clarifies why killing all eight visionaries breaks the loop, and that they're spreading out to make it impossible as a direct reaction to the way Colt is behaving, Colt's betrayal. This is now like a cause and effect type scenario. Uh, this NPC who is like explicitly on your side elaborates and advises you on your next move specifically related to breaking the loop. We're not even touching pursuing Juliana at this point. Um, so now this is linking the player's goals directly to the antagonist, to Juliana, to the eight visionaries, and breaking the loop. It's all now interconnected. Okay, so that's where we begin and that's where we end. Well, what do we do along the way? Chapter needs like a body, right? So let's start with our uh, first goal. Our main goal is to put a spotlight on the time loop and how it works. So we're gonna do this by visiting the same location at different times of the day. And we're gonna use knowledge and the loop to solve a problem. We are going to go to a district. Which one? We don't know yet. It doesn't even matter. What's important is we're going to visit it in the morning, and then we want a second visit with clear differences and good contrast. So in order to just go all in on that, the second visit is going to be in the evening. No one can mistake uh, this district in the morning, in the evening, for being like something that doesn't matter. Very obviously, the time you visit this district will matter. We're going to do two things. What are those things? Well, Ideally, we want the player to be solving a problem. A very simple problem is a locked safe. This is an incredibly like, compact little gameplay vignette. It is both a problem and a solution and a reward, all bundled up into one. Locked safe, you need a way to open it. Inside of it's going to be something good. It's like, like one of the simplest gameplay vignettes you can do. And we needed to find things that were simple because everything else is so complicated. We have um, we, we do want the player to explore the world in order to open this safe, so we need a second district. Which one, again, doesn't matter yet. We just know that we want to visit it in the afternoon, because of course, once you have the way to open the safe, you're going to want to go 
open the safe immediately. So clearly you're not getting the safe a combination code at noon, has to be afternoon. All right, that's our second action. So now the player returns with the code, but here's the twist. The safe is already broken into and empty because we want to have the player use the time loop and knowledge to break the loop. Someone got to it before you, but you keep the knowledge of the safe code. The day loops, you can return in the morning, and now you open the safe. So now we have like the, 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 the backbone, the core idea that is the through line for the opening chapter. What's in the safe? Well, we already figured that out. We know we want it to conclude with the loop preservation protocol. That's what's in the safe. Friendly NPC is there. They had the same goal as you. They were also coming uh, to open that safe. So it makes sense that uh, as you open it, they show up and they're like, okay, and you can have this conversation with them. The scene is triggered. You learn more things, more context. We want the player to spend a full day during this opening chapter. So, all right, we want to include noon and we want to um, have more of the world be visited. We want to showcase more locations during the chapter. So we are going to add a third district to this. With another action, we're going to send a player to another district. They've got to do something. What is that thing? We don't know yet. Probably about time we decide what these districts are. So here's our space-time diagram. And here is our safe and our two time periods. So this is one location that we visit at two times of the day. I mean, morning or evening. Where does the safe go? Where do we put this safe? We have this constraint that it must coexist with content from the entire game. So again, we're not going to create a brand new map as a home for the safe. It has to go into one of these maps. We thought it would be cool if we uh, put the safe in Colts Flat because we can use this to learn more about Colt. Like we said earlier, we want to answer some of the questions the player has. So let's go ahead and answer some of them. And it's also provided a really like simple motivation for Colt as a character. Like he's lost, he's confused. He sees he has a home address. What's the first thing he wants to do? Go check out that home address because he doesn't know about the safe yet. What's drawing him to this location? It's his home. So Colt's flat is in Carl's Bay. But that's a problem because we, we do want to avoid these visionary encounters. So we took everything in Colt's flat and we moved it into an empty apartment in Updown. But that's still a problem because we do want to, of course, return to the safe in the evening. And Alexis is having his party then. We were trying to avoid our visionary, visionary encounters. But it occurred to us that this is actually an interesting opportunity because we do have uh, a PVP feature, PVP or like AI, uh, called Hunter Invasions. This is when Juliana will invade your game. This keeps the antagonist present. I'm not going to be talking about that much during this talk, but we saw it as an opportunity to add um, not just a little mini boss fight uh, at this critical moment in the guided tour or, or, or the opening chapter, uh, but these can only happen when a visionary is present. So putting this at uh, Updom in the evening was actually perfect because that allows this invasion to happen. So now we can justify the safe being broken into by it being Juliana's doing. We have this cool battle. We have more like interaction, more cat and mouse between Juliana and Cole. We're reinforcing the relationship. We're reinforcing the opposing goals in this encounter. And we did it by breaking one of our constraints. But now we have Colt's flat figured out myself some more water. We know where the safe lives. What's next? We have this other action and we don't even know what this action is yet. This action is born from a desire to have the player visit more locations. Uh, we centered this in cult motivations and our need for the player to always understand what their goal is. So first of all, we want to learn that the loop preservation protocol exists. We're gonna be giving the player this reward for a thing. Wouldn't it be great if this was, this was a thing that they were looking for, so they have to know about it so they can be looking for it. We had uh, an existing location, the Loop Control Center, and this is uh, an opportunity for us, again, to answer some of the mysteries. We want to introduce the technology that powers the loop and introduce some of the other characters along the way. 
give the player some of the answers to those mysteries. And we could connect this again to Colt's motivation because he doesn't know how to break the loop yet. He has no idea. He learns about something called a loop control center. So he's like, oh, maybe there's an off button. So now we have a way to make Colt go here. Uh, we have an open slot here at noon in the complex. Everything's perfect. No problem at all. Now we have, uh, we have to send Colt somewhere new. Well, we thought, let's, uh, let's be ambiguous. Maybe Colt doesn't know what the LPP is. Maybe he thinks it's a weapon because it's like, oh, this is a thing that I can maybe use to break the loop. I bet it's a weapon. I bet it's a gun. But our real goal at this point is to deliver that safe code. So how do we how do we merge these goals? How do we connect everything? How do we give the player what they need while Colt is looking for what he wants? We're going to invent our, our one and only brand new location that we introduced uh, for the opening chapter, which is the Aeon Security Office. Um, this also helps us introduce the Aeon program, which was founded by the visionaries. Uh, and give the player a really cool reveal about Colt's identity and their their role in the society. So of course Colt is like, oh, it's at a security office, so it's definitely a gun. So he go he goes over, very very enthusiastic. Uh, and we decided to put that uh, on Priestead Rock, where you can visit in the afternoon. It's like the the in, in the fiction, it's the first place that all of the Eternalists uh, land. Uh, when they're traveling uh, to, to Black Reef. So because it is the location that in fiction it's uh, introducing the characters of the world to Black Reef, it's an interesting spot to introduce the player to Black Reef. Okay, Colt opens the, Colt gets to the security office, does not find the LPP, but he learns that it was in the safe all along. So now the two goals have finally reconnected. All right, let's do a recap. In Updom, uh, the player will go to Colt's flat in the morning and find a locked safe. Uh, they are motivated to then go to the complex, to the loop control center, to look for the off switch. Instead, they learn about something called an LPP, and they learn that they can go to a security office to maybe find it. So then in Freestyle Rock in the afternoon, they go to the security office looking for the LPP. They find the safe code instead in the information that it's in the safe. Uh, they go and they find the safe has been uh, broken into and it's empty. Uh, this is where Alexis is having his party and uh, Juliana attacks. We keep the knowledge of the safe code. We loop to the morning, we open the safe, find the loop preservation protocol, learn how to break the loop, meet that friendly NPC, and we have our guided tour. But we're not quite done yet. There's still residuum and infusion. How are we going to tackle that? So let's look at infusion and something called cognitive load. So what's in the player's starting kit? What do they have in their arsenal at the start of the game? Uh, they have a couple of weapons. They have some gadgets like a hack tool with various fun various ways you can use it. Uh, there's grenades with various ways to uh, detonate them. Uh, there's magical abilities like reprise, which is uh, your respawn ability. There's a double jump, a modification for your weapon. And then on top of all of that, there's something called infusion. And what the fuck is infusion? This is a problem because when infusion is introduced, it's along with many other complex mechanics, and this is the solution to the problem of losing your gear at the end of a loop, but this isn't going to be a problem for another couple of hours or two of play. We were giving the player the solution to a problem that they didn't understand yet was going to be a problem. So here's what we did instead. We took uh, infusion and we removed it from the starting gear. We removed all mention of it from the prologue. As far as the player is concerned, it doesn't exist. We then have our guided tour, where, the play, where during which we will draw attention to when and why you will lose your gear. Colt will complain about it. And then as the player is exploring the world, they will experience the problem of gear loss as they play. So they're getting 
the, um, the problem before they get the solution. Uh, we will uh, introduce a brand new gameplay vignette at uh, Wenji's lab in the complex during her target mission, uh, and they will learn all about infusion and why it's useful. Through the course of, vignette, of this vignette, they'll not only gain the ability, but they will infuse their first weapon. So we're very, very clear about the function uh, of this ability. So that takes care of that. Let's update our campaign chart. We're going to scooch in the guided tour right there between the prologue and the target missions. And then we're going to attach this infusion vignette to Wenji's target mission. OK. <laughs> Let's deliver all this great stuff to the user research team with a, with a big heart on it. And now I think it's time once again to break for questions. <laughs> I think it was already said in a previous talk, but a crack in the slab in a sign or two has been somewhat a recruiting round uh, for the game design of Deathloop about cause and effect. Actually, no, not at all. Um, this, this element is something that we had been exploring and felt really strongly about ever since Dishonored 1. Uh, if you remember in Dishonored 1, you visit um, Clavering Boulevard at night and then you visit during the day. And then uh, we actually had a third visit to it much later in the game that we had to cut. So we were really interested in this concept of revisiting the same area as the story progresses at different times of day. How does it change? How is it impacted by the decisions you make? Um, we then uh, explored it again. We, we didn't explore it in Dishonored 2, but we explored it again in Death of the Outsider with uh, the Bank Job mission where you go to... I don't remember the name of that district, but you go you go to that like location where the bank is, you explore it, there's tons of things to do, and then you return the next night and you continue your adventure. So not 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 really cracked in the slab, but it's been there all along in, in, in many of our designer games. Uh, despite the golden loop being designed as a single solution through experimentation and a resolution of leads, was more than one golden loop solution considered in the initial stages, yes, actually. Were more encounters with visionaries planned, like Harriet had another appearance past the morning, and maybe more ways to group different visionaries in a single location. Yes to all of the above, but just like we had to let go of, of two of the time periods for two of the districts, we had to focus on delivering the best experience possible uh, with, with the content that we were going to uh, provide the player. So whenever like a false lead was proposed, whenever like uh, imagine you could have a visionary diverted to the wrong district as part of the option, uh, whenever like a plan was sketched out of like maybe there's two golden loops, maybe uh, we, can, we can arrange it this way. Uh, it always circled back down to we have a limited number of development hours in the years of production. We have, you know, we're, we, we have the team that we have we have to focus on the best possible player experience. So we made the decision to focus on um, only, only the version that, that, that you saw, only the version that you shipped. Um, in, in an alternate timeline, in a different universe, where this game had a, a bigger team and twice the budget, maybe we could have explored that. Uh, but you know, we, we, we had to make the, the decision to do it that way to, in order to be able to deliver the game that we delivered to you all. Um, I always wondered if various Golden Loop combos were ever considered, like dead ends were, yes, where, where Colt would realize pushing X visionary to Y location isn't actually helpful to him. Yeah, S same answer to the previous question. Uh, Pick Rexley is currently the only friendly NPC we met in the game, uh, but did other friendly Eternalists uh, considered during uh, development? Uh, no. No, uh, Having pick be the only one was was really about making that really special. That that that's like like a real break in the pattern. And if there every time like another friendly eternalist was proposed, it kind of like stole some of the magic uh, from Pick Rexley. So yes, uh, they would get pitched, but ultimately the like the guiding vision there was like. Colt's relationship is with Juliana. This is all about them. If we're going to introduce a third character, 
it's got to be a really special and unique moment. Of course, there's also 2-bit, so technically there's another friendly NPC, but both of those, like, those, both of those are very unique and special. It sounds like designing the puzzles to all link up with each other uh, was his own puzzle on the dev side. That's cool. Yeah, it was like I designed the Clockwork Mansion and then I had to design the Clockwork Campaign. That's something I've said in interviews before. Uh, how much of it was planned, keeping in mind the player would figure it out on their own versus the objective marker and the systems present uh, on the final build? Everything was... We, we tried to keep everything designed so that it would still work and and be like coherent in some way if the player just stumbled across it and was just like curious and tried to figure it out. I actually get into that later in the talk, honestly. Um, from initiation to, okay, I think we've got this down. How long was the period of development for this onboarding section? Uh, the entire talk. <laughs> That's what the talk is about. Uh, like I said on the introduction slide, it was like one year. It 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 was, uh, yeah, like start of alpha until cert, basically. Okay, those are the questions. That... We're now pre-beta. What did the UR folks think? Well, what 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 did their research show? <laughs> so, players played through the guided tour, and wait a sec. Oh no, what's going on? Oh no, what's happening? Players didn't understand how to complete the guided tour. Many of them were completely stumped. Many spent hours in each map after their goals were complete, unsure of what to do. And what's even worse is that players who did complete the guided tour seemed just as lost and confused as the players from the previous milestone. What about infusion? Most players never found it. They just they just never found it. Uh, but those who did, they were okay, right? No, they were not okay at all. Those players did not understand when and how you can infuse your gear and that you didn't need to replay the infusion vignette every time you wanted to infuse a new piece of gear. We saw players were playing that infusion vignette so many times. Um, bottom line was most players still never infused their gear. Sometimes some of them would do it once and then never again. So what happened? Had we failed? Did we just completely like face plant? Moments like these, we have to stop, take a second, and remember. <sighs> yes. Do not panic. <laughs> Let's take a closer look at what's actually going on. Players struggled and were frustrated, but over different things than before. What were those things? Players did understand that they were in a time loop, thank goodness, that Colt and Juliana had opposing goals, that killing eight visionaries in a single loop would break the loop, and that when you did something was as important as what you did. We were meeting our goals. What they didn't understand was how to use any of that, any of the things they learned to then progress through the rest of the game. There were a two to four hour gap of total confusion. Aha. Time to go back in and find a way to bridge the gap. So what's the gap? That is the hours of confusion between completing the guided tour and the player understanding the game's structure. So goal number one is to update the guided tour to ensure that by the end of it, players understand the game's structure. Wait, oh no, that's impossible. The guided tour doesn't use the game's real structure. How can the guided tour explain something that it doesn't even represent. We can't do it like that. Maybe the structure has to change to be easier to understand. So that goal, once again, goes into the bin. Here we are now going to clearly orient the player towards going to visionary strongholds. We want to make searching for clues rather than attack a player-facing goal. We want to directly connect the visionaries to the leads, and we want to drive home that the leads are how you kill all eight visionaries in one loop. Constraints here will be, this is going to focus on how the content is presented, not changes to the content. We're, we're in alpha, we're trying to get to beta, we can't do huge changes, and we had just made a ton of big changes and additions with the guided tour. So we're going to have to be smart. 
and we're going to have to use our trusty waste bin to get through this adventure. So first, let's take a look at breaking the loop clues. What are those? These are clues that result in passive observation. And if followed up with active investigation, it will unlock one of the leads. So for example, a player can, using their eyes and ears, notice that Frank has a fireworks show in the evening. That's a breaking the loop clue. In a perfect world, that would then prompt the player to go to Frank's club and do some investigation. And then the lead would play out as designed. But it's just as likely to guide the player to a place where the lead's path is unclear. Maybe they already know about the fireworks shop and they're like, okay, let's check this place out. At this stage in development, that was a complete dead end. It was just weird. I don't like the player didn't know what to do. Maybe they already knew about the cargo container uh, in Carl's Bay. It's like, oh, there's fireworks in here. It's a dead end. They don't know what to do. It's like, oh, there's fireworks here. It's not connecting me to anything else. So players lost, players completely fused. They're not making the connections they need to. So this is creating, this was part of what was creating the gap between finding the first clue and beginning the lead. And I had to be honest with myself. Did the player really care about the difference between passive observation and active investigation? I believe that some players do, and I definitely do, but I'm a gigantic nerd, so I had to let go. <laughs> Those are going away completely. Well, now we have to look at target missions. These are classic objective tree type deals. They've got titles, they've got objectives, they're broken down into tasks, player, go here, do the thing, congratulations, mission complete, nice fanfare. And this gives the impression that you've done everything you need to do, even if you found nothing related to the lead. Plus, like, killing visionaries isn't even your goal until the golden loop. So why were we starting the game with the goal to kill the visionaries? I'll tell you exactly why. It's because we had just spent like a decade working on Dishonored games, and that's exactly how they worked. So... We were just following our patterns and our habits that we knew and we hadn't stopped to think, oh, does this fit the game we're making? We created all of these target missions and in the end had to get rid of them. So no more target missions. That's no longer a thing. We want to tie the visionaries directly to the leads. And we're gonna do this using a multitude of tactics. So first of all, it is the lead, not the target mission, that is the reason to visit the visionary. Leads can now be kicked off. You don't get a clue that leads you to getting it kicked off. You kick it off, like, officially. This can be done through discoveries throughout the world. That's the act of investigation. Or maybe automatically, just by visiting the visionary or completing another lead. There's the passive observation. <clears throat> and clues discovered out of sequence are either a downplayed or direct the player to the visionary. Discovering a lead will now invite the player to visit the visionary. It's very specific about this. It's not ambiguous. Or if you just decide to visit the visionary, even if you don't have a lead, it'll kick off the lead just by, by like beginning that piece of content. Okay, let's pair up our visionaries with our leads. If there's uh, two visionaries for one lead, we're gonna split that lead in two, and we are going to fashion the content from the target mission from our two visionaries who do not have leads into a form of lead in themselves so it all matches. Let's update these names to the shipped versions and update our chart. But why not end the guided tour with some leads already started? We want to be really player friendly here. So first of all, Infusion. It was similar to a lead similar enough that we fashioned it as a lead. So why not include it as one of the starting leads? Let's go ahead and kick that off as soon as the guided tour uh, is completed. Um, the alpha user research reported positively about Frank's fireworks lead. So we decided to make that one of the starting leads. It seemed to be like a cool way to help the player understand the game. <clears throat> During the guided tour, the player spends a lot of time uh, in updom. So we're like, okay, let's you know use what the player is probably already familiar with will make uh, the two updom visionaries be uh, two of the starting leads. So this is now Charlie and Alexis. Of course, some leads can auto start others, like I already mentioned. Uh, Charlie connecting directly to Fia is logical. They used to always, this used to be one lead in itself. So having it flow directly made sense. Uh, and we used, we looked for other useful uh, narrative links. 
there was no reason for Wenji to have a lead at all before because she was like all alone um, in the complex. But once you discover the connection between Charlie and Fia, that creates the need for the Wenji lead. So that's, the, that's when we decided to kick off Wenji's lead as soon as it became relevant. Uh, we are going to leave a couple of the leads as mysterious, hidden in the background, uh, to reward that exploration of the world, learning about uh, the world and the scenarios that's so important to me. All right, that should help. But we're not quite done yet. We, want to do, we still want to reduce some of the friction, and there's still some cognitive load to take care of. So, like I said, there's no more target missions, so we're now really downplaying uh, Alexis's content to avoid a difficulty spike when they're like in updom in the evening. Before, when you would go to the mansion, there was a target mission there, so you get objectives, tasks, all of that stuff. When you're in the guided tour, just trying to complete the guided tour, and players were trying to defeat Alexis Dorsey during like the first hour or, or second hour of their game, that wasn't working. So that all gets downplayed. Uh, we are we are going to update the dialogue with that friendly NPC to make the next step that they suggest be to go check out Wenji's uh, check out, excuse me to check out Wenji's research. So then that's how we kick off the lead for infusion. Uh, we're going to add exit markers uh, that could appear when your goal was complete. In fact, we like figure out a way to do this throughout the entire game. So now. Uh, when your goal is completed, you get a marker on the exit. It's like, don't worry, player, this is how you leave. You don't have to spend like four hours in each map wandering around. It'll be great. It'll be cool. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we took then um, what turned out to be really distracting content from Wenji's lead, which wasn't really doing anything yet, uh, and we cordoned it off from the infusion vignette content. We actually like locked it behind a door that you can't open until later of the game to make sure that while you're focused on completing the infusion vignette, you're not finding leads about, you know, the, the way that you, you know, uh, defeat Wenji to break the loop. So that's a completely separate experience now. Okay. Time for user research. One more time. We were, pretty, we were feeling pretty good about this. And now it's time to break for questions. Stay turned on, phone screen. How do you as a designer manage letting go of cool ideas that don't pan out in development? Do you file them away to revisit later? I'm curious about the collaboration stuff. Um, I actually recently wrote a, a guide for my team on how to do this. And the guide is heavily inspired by like the classic five stages of grief and working through them. Um, it's something that you just like grow to have experience with through through years of development you understand it's not personal you understand that like a an idea is never wasted because just the practice of having the idea of working through it means you grow as a designer and so even if no one ever gets to experience it, it it's never totally lost and also just knowing that throughout your career you're going to do so much stuff that no one's ever going to see and it's just part of the job um, it takes some it, it, in, in some cases, it can take a while to get used to the idea, um, but ultimately, it's a very natural part of game development, and you just like you just roll with it. Um, I personally played the game with no markers and pop ups, same for Dishonored, and the game is still insanely satisfying to play, even the in-game maps and reference levels. I'm glad you thought so. We we really tried to make that still work. Um, we, we wanted to do more to make it work even better, but again, you, eventually you have to ship the game. Uh, the game IMO should provide an option to start the disabled markers, hence to be activated again if wanted. Maybe the same thing with the videos at the end of every lead. Uh, we agree. We wanted to do that, but again, you, you have to pick and choose your battles. You have to pick and choose the things that you, that you like fit into the schedule. And everything, everything you add like that um, raises new risks, raises new like, oh no, what if the player does this that you have to confront with? And ultimately we had to like say, all right, this is what's important. This is where we need to get to. We have to decide um, uh, to make decisions that we're not always happy with. But yeah, we, we did want to do that. 
Um, while I understand all the problems you had to solve, make the core gameplay more comprehensible to the player in retrospect, would you have changed the prologue to less linear and or handholdy format? Um, there's a few things I would have changed about the prologue map itself. Um, but none of them are to make it less linear or less handholdy. We 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 kind of needed to to keep it that way. There's certain moments where um, it would have been nice to introduce more of like the different like modes of approach in gameplay. Uh, but as far as like the sequence of Holt wakes up, finds uh, his hideout, uh, fi finds the you know the code door travels to uh, Juliana's uh, or, or Barrison's mansion where Juliana is living. That whole sequence, that, that was never something that we uh, considered changing. Uh, often being really handholdy early on in the game is, is just necessary because for every player who's very experienced, very seasoned, they've played a million games, they've played many of our games, there's always that player who maybe this is the first game they've ever played. And we don't want to leave those players behind either. Uh, yes, this is PowerPoint. <laughs> How did you deal with the player choices running class pass? Um, I feel like the class pass question is more a question for the games, for that level's level designer, who was uh, Trish, uh, Tristan Truchot. Uh, I, I believe he is on no social media whatsoever, so I'm not sure he'll ever answer that question. <laughs> Um, but I know I, I wasn't really deeply involved uh, in the design of that. That was really between that levels level designer and like lead LD. I wasn't the lead LD of this project, so I can't answer that. How is level design playing in order to avoid the player looking for leads or important stuff uh, where they shouldn't? Um, it, it's more like we designed it so that if the player was looking for stuff, they'd find something interesting. Like if they're looking for X and they go somewhere and they find Y, that's still cool. Uh, we wanted to encourage exploration whenever we could. Might have been answered before, but were the various sequence breaks in the game in the main leads, like saving the fireworks shop before going to Frank's and 10 from the start, or did they show up as you built them? Uh, we, we roughly sketched out the leads like on whiteboards, very similar to what I uh, walked us all through uh, with the with the guided tour, um, and they usually revolved around a, a, like a central puzzle that you had to solve. And for the the fireworks lead, uh, the the shop that burns down was always the central puzzle of that. It it took on many forms throughout development before we landed on the final one. They each each of the leads had to have like a core. A, like problem to solve in order to progress it. Um, is there anything you personally regret adding to the game? Mm, no. Mm, no. <laughs> there's things I regret not being able to add, but no, there's there's nothing in the game that I mean in in the role that I had. If there was something in the game that I was unhappy that it was in the game, I could have taken it out. So that wasn't an issue. Uh, was the beach bears in mansion ever considered to be a revisible area outside the program? Uh, yeah, absolutely. But but again, you, you have to focus on the core experience. And even if there's a million cool ideas of wouldn't it be neat if, like, okay, do we want to be able to revisit uh, the beach uh, during the noon or in the afternoon or during the evening. A lot of us thought that was super cool. And then it's like, oh no, we have to cut two of our existing maps. There's no way we can do that with the beach, unfortunately. But no, uh, there was even at one point uh, a pitch, I think it came from me, to like as a one-off visit that map in the evening. Um, uh, that that idea never went anywhere. That That never got past just like conversations. Mm -hmm. Was there ever a plan to have Colt put on a wolf mask to infiltrate up down the uh, par night party? Um, there was never a plan, but there was 
probably like at least five designers who thought that they were the first person to have that idea and built like an argument for it and presented it to us. And we were like, <laughs> we all liked the idea. We all enjoyed the idea, uh, but it was considered like off tone for cult. Um, not, not the experience that we wanted for the player in that scenario. Um, incredibly complicated. Um, there's always this confusion of like, are the skins that you do for multiplayer masks, uh, multiplayer matches diegetic? Are they really happening? And like, okay, you have on a wolf mask, how does it interact with the multiplayer feature of the skins? There were a lot of problems uh, with that idea. And it also ultimately uh, looped back to like, we're not going to try to redo Lady Boyle. Like, L Lady Boyle's last party gets to be Lady Boyle's last party. We're not going to try to turn Alexis Dorsey's party into Lady Boyle's last party. So yes, that came up many, many, many times, but it was it was never considered as an option. Any scrapped idea level that you regret not managing to insert on a build of the game? Uh, I, I and some of the other level designers I was working with tried to pitch a more complex and, and detailed lead for Harriet at least three times through development. Um, and, and none of them were like cool enough to justify the extra work. They were adding like this layer of complexity that... Uh, that was proving to be a problem. And, and it was always a case of, that sounds interesting on paper. Is it interesting enough to like take resources away from other topics so that like, you know, we, 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 we have to like do something special in order to kill Harriet during, um, during Golden Loop. That, that's, the, that's the main thing that I regret that we never managed to get into the game. Uh, how come you decided to have only one pathway to Charlie at noon? when all the other visionaries have several paths to their hubs? Um, that is, once again, a question for the level designer. I have good news for you, though. The level designer of that is uh, Julian Evier, who is very chatty on Twitter. He would be very happy to answer that question for you. So I think it's at uh, uh, Pat Falloon. I'm sure someone is following Juli uh, Julian Evier and can post the, the handle uh, in the chat, but... That's definitely a question for him, not for me. Okay, let's keep going. Let's see what user research thought about uh, our beta milestone. Yeah, we're in beta now. So, yes, what's cool is back. So, players were enthusiastic about the game in the hours following the guided tour. Many players still had trouble completing it, though. Like, we weren't in the green yet. There was some friction that remained. Many of what should have been mechanics tutorials were still stumping players. They were still too puzzly. And despite the exit markers, players still spent hours in each map after their goals were completed. Why were they doing that? Simple. They didn't realize that they could come back later. They were suffering from fear of missing out. Players were able to find and begin the infusion vignette in record numbers. But we still needed everyone to find it and complete it. Players didn't understand that it was the infusion vignette that would let you keep your gear. And we were encouraging the players to do it first, but we hadn't been clear enough yet about its utility. We just had, you know, the characters say, go check out Wenji's research. And that was it. Yeah, <laughs> it's right there on the slide. Players were being heavily influenced by their feelings about a familiar genre, so they were making a ton of assumptions. We were hearing, I don't like roguelikes, or this is a bad roguelike. They were sure that it was rare or impossible to keep your gear, so they weren't even trying. They weren't looking for it. They didn't know it was going to be a thing. They thought, this is the game. Players were able to begin the leads in far greater numbers than in previous UR reports, but they still find it frustrating to get very far. Uh, no one was skipping time periods, so progressing through lead was a chore. Did you know that you can skip time periods? I haven't mentioned it in this presentation yet, and turns out we didn't mention it to any of our players either. No one knew it was a thing you could do. Uh, this wasn't a choice. They had no idea it was possible. Without time period skips, the player would have to play map after map after map after map after map in order to complete their goals. 
So this lead with a time skips is this is maybe an hour and a half of gameplay. Play through the whole thing, you know, a nice cool experience. But without time skip, not only is it taking twice as long, but you're having to like take a break from the adventure just to do other stuff. And what's worse is during this point in development, when you visited a map with a visionary, you had to defeat the visionary before you could leave. That was part of the rules of the PvP encounters. So like this, this was a lot of extra time between completing the steps of the lead that the player was stuck with. As a result, no one had, was reaching the golden loop, and we were hearing that the game is tedious and boring. And my goodness, does not does that not feel good to hear? So, how are we going to end the tedium? First, what's the definition? It's the feeling that the game is tedious and boring, caused by needless hours spent in the guided tour and not skipping time periods and not gaining or using the infusion ability. So you're stuck with the starting gear throughout the entire game. Our goals begin with let the player leave a map with a visionary without defeating them or Juliana. This was actually already planned and in progress before that milestone. So it was kind of like, a, yeah, we know this is a problem. We're trying to fix it. We haven't fixed it yet. But more importantly, that's not something that I had to worry about as campaign designer. There was a whole different strike team focused on just that topic. So we're going to take that off the board. That's someone else's problem to solve. My problem was to teach the player how to skip a time period. We want to make sure that all players visit the infusion vignette early on. Our constraints are, oh, wait a second, we're in beta. We're out of time. We're just straight up out of time. Yeah, there it is. We're in beta. <laughs> uh, and it's also the end of the year. It's time to take a break as much as you want to, like, you know, keep going, solve all the problems. You've got to take a break. You have to stop. You have to recharge. Um, this was December 2020. We know what was going on in December of 2020. So I was just at home for like weeks, not traveling, not even like leaving my apartment. I stayed home. I played games. And I noticed one thing over and over. Um, I had been accruing for the past year various free games on the Epic Store because they would do like a free new game every week. So I just had a ton of games that ordinarily I would never consider ever playing. And I was just like luring them up, going through them, seeing what they were like. And a lot of these games had UI tutorials. Huh, this was rare in a first person shooter, but pretty common in other genres. It's kind of sledgehammery, not like super immersive. Immersive is a big buzzword for us, uh, but you know, maybe it's worth a shot. Uh, we're going to ship pretty soon anyway, so might as well just explore. Probably can't do anything, but let's see how we can solve this using UI tutorials. So we wanted to get the band back together. Couldn't quite get the band back together because, again, <laughs> we're in beta. Most people are just focused on bug fixing at this point. So designers get back together. We, we, do, a little, we do a little brainstorm. We cook up a scheme. We made a proposal to production and direction that we already knew the team did not have the time to complete, but we thought, what the hell? Let's propose it anyway. This is our location selection menu. The player will see this menu for the first time after the guided tour. We're going to gray out the menu to put a focus on a single element. It's the complex. This is where we want the player to go next. And then we show a message explaining why. If you know UI tutorials, this is pretty basic. Hey player, you finished the guided tour. Next, we want you to go to the infusion uh, vignette. Go, go get infusion so you can keep your stuff. Check out this handy dandy widget on your UI. Use it to wait until the afternoon. These are what we call modal messages, so you cannot progress until a specific input is made. Player has to then progress to the afternoon. Okay, cool. Now it's afternoon. Now we highlight the complex again, they've skipped the time period, and we force the player to go there. Like, okay, player, great, now select the complex so you can keep your gear. Because I know someone's going to ask, yes, we looked for a way to let players disable this. They could be like, yes, I verify that I understand this, I don't need the tutorials. Again, way out of scope for, uh, for what we were doing. <laughs> I'm, I'm just, I'm answering that question now because I know it's going to come up. 
So every player is brought directly to the infusion vignette by the end of the opening chapter, along with why they want to go there. And we reinforce that over and over again. We thought it was clunky. We didn't like the feel of it. It's like breaking the like the flow. I use the word unimmersive here, but it's, it's more than that. But nevertheless, we really needed to solve this problem. And everyone agreed that it could work. I'll accept that one problem that I had already highlighted. It's like, we're out of time. Like, like what's the point? I'll tell you what the point is. Something cool happened. We got a new release date. Yeah, we got we got a couple more months. It was not going to be a lot of time. It was going to be barely enough, in fact. Um, but we knew we could do it. So let's get the band really back together. Uh, not quite. A modified, an evolved version of the band. So our producer is back. Thank goodness we relied on her tremendously. Um, but our lead UI UX designer is way too busy with a thousand other topics. So we're on our own here. Uh, However, a programmer from that team was able to join in, and uh, she had a lot of UI UX experience herself as a member of the team, as a programmer, so she was able to fill in. Um, the gameplay programmer from uh, before, same, them, same one that we were familiar with working with, is back on the crew as well, uh, and a brand new engine programmer would be joining us because now we're working on more like a core engine feature with these UI tutorials. Um, these three programmers are going to collaborate really closely together. Uh, the lead level designer at this point stepped in to handle the duty of, uh, you know, of uh, taking care of, of these issues and supporting our work. Um, and with the lead UX designer uh, busy elsewhere, I'm responsible for even more UX topics. I'm going to trust the other designers. I have the UI UX programmer to assist. Um, but now, but now it's now I'm really in deep. Now, now I have to actually like like show what I've learned. Still a newbie at this point. Okay, so we got team in a bit more time. What else can we do? Because of course you give designers, you give devs like a little bit more time. It's like, oh, you you don't have enough time to complete these goals. Here's some more time. So immediately we're like, well, we can find more goals, right? Yeah, let's do it. We also want to explain Colt's gear. So when the player is doing the infusion, they know what any of this junk is that they're that they're infusing. And we want to provide much clearer guidance through the opening after so we uh, through the opening hours. We want to iron out all that friction. We want to get players through that guided tour so they can experience the meat of the game. All right, let's zero in on the opening chapter in totality. We have the uh, the new UI tutorials. And we're going to use them to explain uh, the gear, how it works, what the upgrades are, how to equip them, all that stuff. During the guided tour itself, we are going to just double, triple, quadruple down on the tutorialization of all this stuff because these were not meant to be puzzles. We want to teach the player how to interact with batteries, how to use your hack tool, how to, how to navigate all these challenges, to teach them how to do that so that they could then go enjoy the game when they're not having their hand held. Uh, and we're going to just straight up add a, mess, add a message explaining specifically that it's safe to leave the map. It's okay to come back later. You don't have to worry about doing everything this map offers during this visit. Focus on uh, this story content. You can come back later. Do whatever you want. Trust us. It'll be great. And we had already designed that tutorial about the time skip going to Infusion. So uh, that was ready to go. Okay. So that is now uh, between the guided tour and the starting leads. So at this point, that's all we could think of that we had the time and the budget for anyway. And uh, like, like we have to hold our breath because this is going to be the last user research milestone before they ship. Anything we don't get right after this, it's like, that's it. Like we're, we're not going to get any more advice. We're not going to get any more consulting. We have to, this, this is it. So let's see what happened. <laughs> and let's break for questions. What were some of the other plans uh, with Gideon Fry? Gideon Fry, the delivery guy. I remember you or somebody else saying something about him being an actual character uh, in the game. Um, when we did the Golden Loop update, there were fun plans to introduce uh, Gideon Fry in the flesh. 
that 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 never made it you know we again scope budget uh schedule you had to pick and choose what we added um and ultimately we were we were just kind of like paying off a joke and it was weaker than some of the other content that we planned so ultimately we like gideon fry stayed just a voice in the box but no we we did want to have a bit more fun uh with gideon fry post release didn't get a chance to. I wasn't involved with any of that. That was something that was happening in parallel to my work. How was loop stress design? This this looks like a, a question for the, the systems designers, not me. Around which milestone was it implemented? I have no idea. Had a confused user research team. Probably I wasn't focused on those aspects. Um, probably can skip the rest of this question. This, this is a question for Dinga, not for me. <laughs> Um, with Outer Wilds being recently released at the time, if I recall correctly, to influence user expectations, how the time work works during testing. Um, I don't recall. I don't recall Outer Wilds ever coming up during during UR. But it certainly affect us as designers. Like we we love that game. Uh, Outer Wilds is one of like my favorite games of all time. There were many designers who loved it. We knew we were making a game that was very different from it. We weren't going to try to like copy it or replicate it. Um, but I don't feel like it ever came up during UR. M most of the games that got mentioned during UR was, is more like classic uh, roguelike games with those like very straightforward uh, roguelike loops. Um, regarding the decision to try UI tutorials, is that how the writing on the wall was born floating messages no floating messages are as old as death loop itself floating messages is a very 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 old idea that's uh sashka duval the original uh narrative designer on the game is the is the 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 floating messages are her brainchild i believe uh why can't we munch on the super good looking food all over black reef uh, that's one of the uh, multiplayer topics we wanted to, um, like if it's a pickup, it has to do something, it has to have a function. So usually food in games heals you. So now food becomes an economy topic and now food becomes game balancing. Now food becomes uh, a systems feature that you need a systems designer to hand place. And wouldn't it be easier if food was just decorative so the artist can place it so it's part of the mise-en-scene so it's part of the the set dressing is part of the ambience it's decorative that that's where that all came about but again that's that's not really a, a topic for me but that was a decision that came pretty early of having to let go of the idea of letting the player eat food there was a lot of people who felt like like let the player eat it even if it doesn't do anything but i, I feel like there was kind of a it's like a design values conflict there of if there's an interaction, it has to have a function kind of thing. I would have liked to munch on the food. Some of the food looked really yummy, but yeah. Each map changes a ton over the course of a given loop. What was your favorite bit of scenery to play around with as the day goes on? Uh, you mean as a designer? Because um, I... I switched to campaign design before I really like before it was really time to super dig into all those variations. So I as like as a designer, I didn't necessarily have the opportunity to interact with that. <clears throat> um, the one that I was involved with the most is the one we talked about with the fireworks lead, the whole um, Otto's workshop burning down. Um, as a player. Uh... It's hard to say. It's really hard to say. I don't know. I don't. I don't have a quick answer answer for that. What games did you enjoy in your twenty twenty break? Oh, I I I don't remember. I I would have to. Yeah, I honestly I don't remember. That was that was like four years ago. No, three years ago. <coughs> I don't remember. I'm sorry. How did you get more time for a production of the game? Uh, Dinga did. Dinga is persuasive. <laughs> Uh, was it the pandemic uh, delaying everything? I mean, it's a factor, but yeah, that's that's a question for Dinga. I, I can't answer that. Was the multiplayer protect the loop gameplay a part 
of any of this user research? Oh yeah, tons, but completely out of my out of my wheelhouse. Yeah, there was just as much focus on that uh, on the work I was doing. I'm in this talk. I'm just focusing on the campaign design, the onboarding, like the the the, the story content, teaching those like core mechanics of the of 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 the adventure through the game. But but no, the folks working on the PvP were going through very similar adventures to this. That I I don't know those stories. Those are those are their horror stories to tell. I couldn't even tell you uh, which designer was working on that. Uh, the level designer who was part of the um, the PvP strike team, I believe that was Suvan Mengi, who was also on Twitter, but I do not remember his Twitter username. I know that Julien Evier, you recently did a shout out to him, though something about a something about a Counter Strike map. I don't remember. Yeah. Did players have too much trouble with the idea of revisiting all places and new objectives? No, not at all. I don't recall that. I don't know. I don't. I don't. I don't remember that ever being a problem. Auto blacksmith shop. Yes. I think. I think we have another Arcanite in the chat. We are now at the final report in late beta. How did it go? Well, success. Players enjoyed a frictionless guided tour. They understood time skips and how to play infusion. And then many of them rage quit. Wait, what? Yeah, they were rage quitting. Oh no, players spent, players no longer spent hours in the guided tour playing like each map for hours, just like going through all the content. Uh, they were no longer struggling to find the infusion ability. Um, and as a result, they were going directly to Frank's club. It was a starting lead after all. That was my wonderful idea. And they would die over and 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 over. They would die a lot. Frank's club is hard. Many players said that if they were playing at home, that it wasn't part of like a like a UR test. After hitting this wall at Frank's, they would have shelved the game. Um, this was during the pandemic, so a lot of them were playing at home. But what they meant was it wasn't part of a, wasn't part of a user research session. Uh, so what's the good news? Once past Frank's club, players progressed happily through the leads until they completed every lead they could find, and then they got stuck. Many players never found Igor or Harriet's leads. The early game had trained them that they'd find leads by following leads. So with these two missing leads, players were hitting a wall and unable to finish the game, and they were not happy. What about Infusion? We were sending a player directly to the Infusion vignette, and this paid off, but we were stuck with a brand new problem. Solve one problem, find another. Players understood that you needed to infuse your gear to keep it, how to gain the ability, what your gear was, but they didn't understand the residuum economy and when you could infuse things. They thought you needed to grind for residuum every time period for the entire loop. You can only infuse at the end of the loop and this put up a wall to their progression. They weren't even trying to infuse things or like, oh, I've got to save up my residuum and then maybe later I can infuse something. So our, player, our players were frustrated and upset. And yeah, fuck, shit, this is scary. But we have to remember, don't panic. <laughs> this feedback was intense because the players liked the game. With all the other friction removed, the scrutiny was now much higher. We were once again out of time, but we were not ready to give up. No more user research meant no mistakes. Time to dismantle the wall and we're on our own to do it. The wall is uh, the moments that block the player's progress. That's Frank's club, Igor and Harriet's leads, and the residuum economy. First goal, we want to ease the difficulty in Frank's club. Except do we? Do we really want to do that? Because we thought the design was good. We actually really liked the design of Frank's club. We thought it was one of the stronger uh, visionary encounters. And back when players were only encountering it many hours into the game, 
we got good feedback on it back then too. Players seemed to really enjoy it. So we wanted to find a different solution. We're not going to nerf the difficulty in Frank's Club. We are going to make it less likely that the player will go to Frank's before they're ready. We want to design new clues to draw the player to Igor and Harriet's leads. Oh no, wait, we can't. We're out of time. We're too close to shipping. There's no time or resources to design new clues. No, we have to figure out how to make do with what we already have to direct the player to these leads. We want to devise a through line to ensure all leads can be found in the critical path. We're going to do this by moving things, not creating new things. And we want to help players understand that grinding isn't necessary for infusion. And our constraint is that we have a matter of weeks to solve this and there's going to be no more user research tests. So every solution has to be the right solution. Let's get started and let's start with the location selection menu. Um, simple visual design principle is that elements closer to the center are higher in the visual hierarchy. Um, Frank and Freestad Rock were pretty close to the center, so we just moved it. You just we just swapped it with Carl's Bay. Now Harriet's location is higher in the visual hierarchy. Um, but you know, I don't, I didn't feel like this was enough. I felt like it's a start. It will help but we needed to be sure we solved it. We couldn't do something that we thought maybe might solve it. So let's focus on our problem leads. First, we're gonna move the difficult leads to be something the player can discover later in the game. So that's, that's Frank and Alexis, clearly two of the hardest locations in the game. And we're gonna take these two leads that the player can't find and we're just gonna make them the starting leads. There you go, problem solved. We wanna build logical connections to make it all flow. So Harriet connects to Frank's, we put a clue at Harriet's uh, location. We, like, we moved an existing piece of content onto that critical path so the player can easily find it. And we might maybe tweak one or two lines of text in certain readables. Um, and like, we, there was already the logical connection between Igor and Alexis's lead, we didn't have to change anything there. That was already true. Same with Wenji, they're going to the party. Easy way to tease uh, Alexis's lead. Um, and what we also found a way to uh, provide more clues for Juliana's lead on uh, the crit path for Wenji. Takes care of it. We're leaving nothing to chance here. And this is the final campaign structure. Last thing we're gonna do, opening chapter, we're gonna add one more UI tutorial to confront the grinding. We want to guide the player through sacrifice in their gear and infusion. We want to show them that this can be done as early as morning, before morning, actually. Even before you complete one map of play, you can already use residuum to infuse something. And there's our opening final chapter. So this is it, right? It's time to ship. <laughs> no time for questions. Let's see what happened. It is now shipping day, September 14th, 2021. And we did pretty okay. We, we, we did pretty okay. We had a fun award season too. Um, but the story isn't quite over yet. There's a brand new epilogue because it's been several years since then. So 2021, October. I began doing my own user research using Twitch streams. Oh, that's what I was doing on here. Playing the game and discussing it with fans, looking for things, looking for things, gathering opinions, gathering thoughts, seeing how the players felt about different things, playing through different sequences with the players, gathering ideas, gaining ideas. Uh, in parallel, though well received, there was also criticism about the game's accessibility. So our UR UX teams got right back to work. Uh, meanwhile, I got my fancy promotion to campaign director and began working what working began applying what I had learned uh, during my own <laughs> UR work uh, to a game update. It would become the Golden Loop update. Um, in May, the uh, the UX team released a massive accessibility update. Pretty pretty successful. It got some nominations. It won some award. Most improved accessibility. Super proud of that. And then we release the uh, the Golden Loop update, which incorporates hundreds of changes and an extended ending, which I wasn't involved with. 
But a lot of those changes and additions and tweaks and polish was based on like th things I discovered and learned while Twitch streaming Deathloop. <laughs> so we have a happy ending. But what did we learn? Uh, creating a complex game that isn't quite like what the player has experienced before is very cool. But it's even cooler to take the time to set up what the game is and how to play it. You want to establish the central conflict, build towards the player's goals so they mean something, be crystal clear about the structure of the game, even if that means changing the structure so it's possible to make it clear. Spring into action with enthusiasm, no matter how difficult the feedback is, is very cool, but you still want to slow down and think your options through. You need to sometimes realize that the reported problem is a symptom, not a cause of an issue. If you think something the players are Hating is good. Trust your instincts. Sometimes something else in the game could be causing them to hate it, or you could solve it in a way that doesn't involve changing that thing that they hate. It's sometimes less cool to make less than ideal choices in reaction to the UR because you're out of time and you have more work than your team can handle, and crunch is never an option. But what's still cool in the end is that even if the solution could be an obtrusive tutorial that everyone wishes you could turn off, that's clunky, unimmersive, it's better than the player not knowing how to play the game. It is very cool to have a fantastic UR team that you can continue to call on throughout production. It's also really cool to involve many developers across many teams uh, in user experience design in addition to your UX specialists. You can involve the UI artists and coders themselves, narrative designers, game systems designers, level designers, or maybe even a campaign designer. It is very cool to remember not to panic. You want to slow down, look at the data, listen to the UR team. The data can look dire. It can look like things are getting worse. But here's the thing. People give harsher feedback when they feel invested in something. The closer you are to getting it right, the more intensely negative the feedback can get. Designers that are trained in UX and trust the UR team can cut through that fog of war. Finally, remember these lessons, but also coolest thing of all is to make it part of your studio culture. Don't be afraid of complexity, but come with a plan to onboard the player. And if you can't make that onboarding happen, simplify. Make collaboration with the user research team central to your processes across design teams. Don't rush. Take it slow. Think it through. Be practical. Look for economic solutions. Don't panic. And thank you to a bunch of people, to our creative director, Dinga, for always believing in this game, for never giving up on it, for fighting for that delay, for fighting to make sure we had everything we needed to make this game what it could be. For all the various people I brought up uh, in, in many of the discussions as I'm talking about different teams, different collaborations around the studio. So many people were involved in all the work I just described. Uh, to our user researchers and consultants, we have our uh, UR team within Bethesda, but we also have consultants at uh, Egocon and Aim Assist and McGid do uh, user research tests. So they're bringing in players who like play test the game and give us feedback. And we had a cap game in Apex assist with the uh, accessibility update. There are many Deathloop teams all around the world. Of course, Arcane, we got a lot of assists from machine games as well. The folks at Bethesda, especially the QA team, very important to our process. Uh, MK12 um, created those wonderful animations. I used their artwork throughout this presentation. Naturally, we have our, like the folks at Sony and Xbox and all the support they offered. Xbox was critical for that accessibility update. Um, I've got my talk coaches. Uh, Anouk was my advisor for the UX Summit, which was the first time I did this talk. Kept pushing me to make the talk better and better and better. Um, Brenda Romero was really excited about this talk and gave me like a ton of support when I did that final like not well now second to final uh, session where I went to uh, to Galloway. She basically acted like uh, my unofficial agent getting that all set up for me. And uh, Celia, one of our um, one of the people who who assisted in training in UX 
uh, at our studio after t like hearing me speak for like i swear no more than 30 seconds she's like that would make a great talk i think you should do a talk about that um, and we've been pals ever since there are a ton of people in addition to many who i've already listed who gave help and input on this talk and there's the people who helped out my trip twitch stream stuff including Anna Marabella, who's with us here today, assisting with the questions and the moderation. Uh, Eva, or Eva. Eva, Eva is not French, Eva's German. She has her own way to pronounce her name, it's not the French way. Uh, that was my co-host back during the streaming days. And uh, Thini, who taught me a lot about just like the basics of how to stream to begin with, got me started on the whole streaming thing. And all you folks for joining me today, thank you for being here. And now we're gonna really do the questions time. All the questions now, but let's first check the check check the one that's check the ones that Grumble has compiled. Circling back like some unique dialogue around action, in the Juliana. I I again way outside of of like the scope of my work. I do believe that that was desired at one point, but it was just. It was so low, low in priority compared to other things. There was just no way to fit it in. To have Juliana have have uh, unique interactions with the visionaries. Um, is there any particular puzzle slash side content that you call your favorite? Um, something I really particularly enjoy. Uh, I really like two bit. I, I like most. I like most things surrounding two bit. I like. I like, even though it's incredibly obnoxious, it feels like we're being like evil troll devs, the little talking Alexis doll that you have to bring to. Um, oh, fun, fun, fun tidbit. I don't know if this is known. Like this, this might be a, I hope that this is true, but I believe that the the speech that the, the little bobblehead does uh, as you carry it was like the audition uh, side when like when we were trying to cast the Alexis Dorsey actor, is it wasn't it isn't literally that, but it's based on that. Um, that that might be a a fun if true piece of trivia. Do you have a favorite among the visionaries? Favorite map is variations among the four time periods. Uh, favorite visionary is Wenji Evans. Easy. Uh, favorite map and its variations among the four time periods. Not not really. I don't 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 ask me to pick my favorite child. <laughs> Man, that's gotta feel good seeing all the slam dunk reviews after a tough tough dev cycle. Uh, the first review that I saw, I think it was the GameSpot one, the ten out of ten, was actually it it uh, it arrived on my screen while I was in like a call with a member of our uh, PR team. I think we were setting up like an interview that I was going to be doing, um, and like that that caught us both really off guard. Like we we were hoping it would go well. Uh, but it started off really well, and we're like, okay, so it's probably all going to be downhill from here. And it just wasn't. They just kept coming. It was amazing. Sorry, got to go. Looking forward to the video on demand. If you have any more questions, would there be a place to to place be to ask those questions? Um, uh, at Dana E. Knight on either uh, Twitter or Blue Sky. I'm glad it can be a huge inspiration, uh, Lorenzo. Do you have any important takeaways on playtesting a game in which the player has to keep track of compounding story information? Um, there, there's a takeaway that I try to tell everyone all the time and no one believes me, which is that no player remembers a single goddamn thing from the first 30 minutes of your game. You have to repeat, you have to refresh, you have to remind, you have to reintroduce. If you introduce a character in the first scene, the next time the player sees that character, they'll have no idea who they are. Um, re repetition, refresh. Um, I feel like that's the main thing that gets taken for granted. Tell us something you think we wouldn't know. Oh. Fun story during production or unknown cut content. The, the whole concept of, of uh, Igor's uh, machine turning invisible was really hard to sell to the team. That was there were so many people skeptical uh, about that idea, um, but I felt like it was, I felt like that was really fun and just it's it's such an Igor thing to happen um, that that I fought for it and we made it work. 
Um, so may, maybe that counts as a, a thing you didn't know about. But that that there there were a lot of things that I pitched that died that didn't make it anywhere that just you know I I was it was either like not possible or I was convinced that it was an idea. That's an example of one like his like that machine that lets you put the code in to hear the um, the signal and then you have to sit, like disrupt it. You have to change the the result or something like making that actually invisible and that puzzle about like making it visible again using the um uh, using the portable basically overseer music machine but like the death loop version of that that's something that I, I had to fight really hard to get in and just prove out the idea prove out the idea that was a struggle but i'm I'm happy with the final result so death loop world and the sound world is the same for real yeah um I love that we can find the spies in Updom during the afternoon. Yeah, the, the whole content, the whole that whole like subplot of the spies is so fun. I I really enjoyed reading those. Some great writing in those. Who added the Clockwork Soldier scribble in the uh, Alexis Mansion? Uh, the my my level artist partner on Clockwork Mansion was David DiGiacomo, and I believe. I'm trying to remember the, the gender of the child, but let's go scoop a child. Davos child just sketch that out because of course, you know, that's that's uh, Clockwork Mansion is as much Davis work as mine. So one of one of his kids sketched the Clockwork Soldier and he snuck it into the game. Uh yes. Yes, there is. Um it's in uh, it's in Updom, I think instead of the concert. Yeah, if if you set off the bomb, or or blow, blow the reactor and then escape, um, the concert in Updom is is switched out with a different scene. I think there's four tunnel exits on Black Reef that are marked on the map but not accessible. Were those areas that were sketched out early on? The stone's always gonna be collapsed. Uh, you mean the map that goes into the um like the physical map in the game world where you see like the map is in the tunnel and you can look at it and you can see where all the tunnels are is that the map you mean that was made very late and I, like i think that was even made uh like based on user research feedback of like players didn't understand what those tunnels were about like oh let's make a map explaining the tunnels uh, but no i that was a lot the, a lot of that was just aesthetic that was just like world building in the creation. Certainly there are um, tunnels that were like part of early drafts of the map that got scrapped, but that that drawing was created like probably early mid beta. <laughs> now you can answer this for plot and story reasons, but are all of the floating messages from cult a cult? Uh, yeah. They're, they're not just from a cult they're, they're from the cult that you are that those are those are all coming from from our cult's head uh probably half and half like the the, the rough sketch of what the story um didn't really change that much but it got fleshed out a lot um, most of what got uh, iterated on uh, involved uh, the other cults and like tr trying to I mentioned earlier the idea of not really letting cult have other people he interacts with other than Juliana and having pick be like this rare exception and two bit be another weird exception uh, and one one like trick of doing that was to have the different characters that you encounter that you can have conversations with just be like different versions of yourself so it's not completely lonely you do feel like there's other characters you can meet but they're just like alternate versions of you so you're not really like meeting a friendly face uh out there uh, but a, a lot of that came together uh, much later in the development of the story like the concept of these other cults that you can meet it was, it was really fun to see that being developed. I love how Crosby audio log answers why cult 
as many weird words. Yeah, he's the word king. We had so much fun coming up with all those um, like attempts at guessing the password. And it's, it's one of those things where, yeah, I keep saying we have to pick and choose our battles. We have to decide, dis decide what to spend time and resources on. Um, but that was considered, like that bit was considered such a fun exploration of Colt's character, his personality, like his his randomness, his playfulness, his spontaneity, and, and just his vocabulary that like we just went went all in on it. Uh, and then it's reinforced with uh, with the word king joke. However, um, some would say that that um, the truth is is he actually um, is bad at Scrabble, which is why he needed to play his rack password uh, to do it. Uh, but that's not my opinion. I think Colt really is the word king. He just saw the opportunity to use his, his rack password. Uh, Pick Rexley is definitely not Lila. So, sorry, <laughs> sorry to just kill that, that theory. No, Ly Lila really died. That's, that's, uh, Pick Rexley is, uh, is, is just a, just a random internalist. Uh, two reasons for not making 451 be the first code you enter in Dab Loop. Um, one is we wanted the, we wanted all the codes to be randomized for every player, because if they weren't, then the invaders would be able to use the codes. Um, and that had to be true in the prologue as well, because it had to be the same code that you use on all the tunnels throughout the game. So if it was a 451 and that was your tunnel code, all of your invaders would know your tunnel code and you didn't have that like that safe space from invaders. So it had to be randomized. Um, why didn't we try to like find a second combination? Um, at this point, you know, in, 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 the, in the culture of immersive sim devs, that meme has kind of lost all meaning at this point. Like it just shows up everywhere now in, in games that have nothing to do with this lineage. It's, it's, it, it's, it's evolved. Like the concept of what that code is and what it means has completely evolved at this point. So rather than just like continue the same pattern that we were see doing, it's like, let's have some fun with it. Let's, let's turn it into a gag. Let's, let's make it so that only players who know about this and who are looking for it would do it. So then we have like the, you know, the code, you know, the code, you know, the code and the door. And so many players would then go up to be like, yeah, fuck no, I know the code. And they would enter 0451 and it wasn't it. And then Colt would say old habits die hard. And that to me was like, you know, uh, it was my idea, by the way. Um, it, it, it felt way, it felt like a way to like nod to it, but not just repeat the same pattern. Which visionary would win in a dance off? Alexis, obviously. <laughs> Glad you think so. Yeah, I, I agree. Help, help to have a really good cast too, really good writers. <clears throat> it was, you know, big team effort, good, good voice direction, all of it. Okay, I think we'll I think we'll wrap it up. We're we're getting past nine, and I need dinner. But uh, this was fun. Thank you, for, thank you, everyone who showed up. And bye. <laughs> yeah, don't panic. <laughs> I I I do hope some people knew that that was a Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy reference when I was whenever I was saying don't panic. But it looks like at least someone did. Yeah. <laughs>